Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our study of the book of the prophet Amos. This is now our seventh part of the study, seventh program in the study. Wow. Yeah. And as usual, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's so blessed that we can spend time in the Word together. Amen. Because it is the word that God uses, that potter uses, to mold and shape us into what he wants us to be. And you know what he wants us to be? We are destined, we are predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Lord, use that today. Hallelujah. Uh, okay, so we're going to get right into this, right after Brother Mark here asks God blessing on our time together. Thank you. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for your word. And we just thank you that we can be molded to Jesus' image. Amen. And just let us see in your word where we can do just that. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to pick up today and, and start at Amos chapter 3. Mm-hmm. We're going to start at verse 7 and 8. But before we do that, we, we left off, we kind of ran out of time in our last program. Mm-hmm. As I was talking about a, a, a very important scripture. In verse 6, one of those questions, rhetorical questions that the Lord asked through Amos was, if calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? You know, I think sometimes it's only the lawyers and insurance guys that may have a better handle on on this than the theologians do. (laughs) See, everything bad that happens, everything bad that happens that they might have to pay for, they blame it on God. It's an act of God. But have you ever considered the possibility? I want to give you something from the word of God in the book of Job. It says in Job 2, I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. Then Job's wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Mm-hmm. In all this, Job did not sin. So if I say that, now you think I'm sinning because I say, you know, listen, God's in control. Things that happen, things that we see as calamities going on in the world can be the hand of God at work. Mm-hmm. Now you know what? He can use the devil. He can use Satan as a tool in That's his right. hand. But it's still God who is in control. Absolutely. Don't ever believe differently than that. And if you didn't like that, you're certainly not going to like this. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to read from Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 24 through 30. He says, Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will even laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes on like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come on you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they shall not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. I am telling you. Where was that again? Proverbs, Proverbs. chapter 1, verses 24 through 30. You, you had better understand this. God is a God who is there, who is ready, willing, desiring to hear from us, mm-hmm. for us to be in touch with him. But you can't go on and on and on rejecting the word of the Lord. And then when your trouble comes, thinking, well, you know, maybe he will and maybe he won't. But he has the right to not do it. That's right. Okay. You have to remember Deuteronomy 28. Mm-hmm. This is Deuteronomy 28 is the choice between if you obey God, if you hear him and obey him, all those blessings are going to come upon you. But the other side of that coin is if you hear his voice and disobey him, all of these curses, and there's more curses than there are blessings, okay? Think about the fact. You know, what? we've been saved. Hallelujah, we've been mm-hmm. saved. What have we been saved from? Well, we've been saved from sin. We've been saved from the curse of sin. We have been saved, Paul wrote, from the wrath of God. 
There is such a thing as the wrath of God in the New Testament. That's right. Okay. This is why. Now, it's not for us. If you look at Romans chapter 12, God says, you know, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. We are not to return evil for good, but we're to return good for evil. But before it says that, it says, revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. I will repay. And God will repay. Okay? You better get that through your head. When Jesus comes back, now, you know, he came back. He came into this world the first time, meek and humble. Here is the King of kings and the Lord of lords born as a child in a, not even room for many in, but in a stable. Mm-hmm. Won't be that way come next time. It will not be that way next time. He's coming back riding a white horse with a sword in his hand mm-hmm. and fire shooting from his eyes. There's a song that was written in the mid-1800s uh, here in the United States. And I, I'm, I'm doing this, I don't really recall. Mm-hmm. Oh, my eyes have seen the glory mm-hmm. of the coming of the Lord. He's coming He's coming with that wrathful sword. He is coming. Be on his side and you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> but now is the time to do that. Now is the time. Not when you see that coming. I don't know. Okay. Today is the day. Of salvation. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart like the people of God did out in the wilderness. Okay. All right. Amos 3. I'm going to read 7 and 8. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Mm -hmm. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Who can but prophesy? Mm -hmm. You know, when I first read the accounts of Elijah, I thought, my goodness, is this a a human? I mean, some of the things, you know. But it says in James 5, that he is a man with nature like ours, just a man, right? But a man used by God and willing to be used by God, submitted to God. So God taught his mighty and faithful prophet Elijah to hear his voice, not just in the mighty rushing wind, not just in the thunder and lightning, but in that still small voice. Yes. You know the account when he was fleeing from Jezebel, right? Because you see, that fear of Jezebel that had grabbed him and caused him to flee was replaced by the fear of God that filled his heart. That fear of God, which the word says is to hate evil and leads to knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, and which all seems grossly, that fear of the Lord seems grossly lacking in a church today that is intent on and content with self-esteem, mm-hmm. prosperity, wishy-washiness. Mm-hmm. Okay? We serve a mighty God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. It was the fear of the Lord, that wonderful, overpowering awe of God mm-hmm. that Amos had carried with him from Judah in the south up to Israel as he faithfully prophesied. Who could do otherwise? Who can but prophesy? Right? He was under. He was a man under compulsion. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, the apostle Paul wrote and said to the Corinthians, "For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel." First Corinthians nine sixteen. It's not, he, he has nothing to boast of. God had his hand on him. And you know why? Because he had surrendered his life to God. He reveals his secret counsel to his prophets. What's his secret counsel? Well, what, I mean, what does God want from you? I'm glad you asked that question. Micah 6, 8 says this. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 8. Mm-hmm. He didn't hide this. I mean, people say, What does God want? What does God He's, This isn't a secret. It is no secret what God has done. Because it says in Deuteronomy 29 29, mm-hmm. the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Yes. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of the Lord. 
God reveals them to us so that we can observe them, so we can do. Right? Yes. So who are we speaking of now? To his servants, the prophets. You see, this would be a good time. I mean, we're having a Bible study. Hallelujah. We're having a Bible study in the book of Amos. We're having a Bible study that is not about Amos. Hmm. Okay? He was a tool in the hand of a mighty God. All right? We're not looking for knowledge about Amos, that, but that comes, right? Our purpose is to come to have a greater understanding and knowledge of God. That's right. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5 says this. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Did not Jesus tell the parable or it Matthew 13 about the man who went out and searched, found the pearl of great price? You search for God. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We have to have a knowledge so that just like Paul prayed, okay, I'm going to read a prayer that Paul prayed. To the, for the Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus. It's in the first chapter of Ephesus. He said, you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but in also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. How do you get that? Because you see, Many of the afflictions of the righteous, we all run into trouble. Well, perhaps you've not noticed that. You know, this is something the Lord showed me a long time ago, and I, it's serving me well today. To be able to look, I, to look at your, your situation, your tribulation, your trial, your problem, look at smack dab in the face and say, He is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is risen. I saw a thing, and I mentioned it in one of our studies before. I, I saw a little thing that said, don't tell you, God, how big your problem is. Don't go tell God, oh, the problem I have, oy. Right. Tell your problem how big your God is. That's right. Right? Okay. So there's the who, why, what, where, that's the honorary. What's the what? What is a prophet? In Hebrew, it's nabi. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's the Hebrew word nabi. In Greek, it's prophetes. You see, and the answer lies in that Greek word, which literally means to speak for. That's what pro, for, and is to speak, right? But if you're going to speak for God as a prophet, you're not only to speak what they have heard, well, let me, we're only to speak what we have heard, right? That's what Amos is saying here. You're only to speak. He's only going to speak what he's heard from God. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Peter wrote that in 2 Peter chapter 1. But that's what, Amos isn't thinking this stuff up. He's not leaning on his own understanding. He's not thinking about what, oh, what should I tell him when I get there? You know, this is true even of Jesus, isn't it? The living word, the word made flesh who dwelt among us. The prophet who was foretold by Moses. To be the great prophet, right? Because Jesus said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father told me. John 12, 49 and 50. Prophetes. If you didn't hear it from God, you're not speaking for it. Okay? You're leaning on your own understanding, which, we, you know, it says in Proverbs 3 that we are not to do. Okay? 
just a little aside because I just think this is very, very, very interesting, very cool. Mm -hmm. you ever, I, have you ever heard of General Sir Edmund Allenby? Mm -hmm. He was called by the Turkish Muslims in Palestine, Allah Nabi. He took the formal possession of Jerusalem in the Holy Land on behalf of the British in 1918. Uh, he was the British commander that led that. Mm -hmm. The New York Times reported in September of that year that the Arabs had long had a prophecy that he who shall save Jerusalem and exalt her among the nations will enter the city on foot, which Allen B. did, by the way, mm -hmm. and his name will be God the, God the prophet, Allah Nabi, Allen B. <laughs> the British then hold, held that holy land until it was turned over to the Jewish people in 1948 because it belongs to the Jews. It belonged to the Jews 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. It belongs to the Jews today. today. Okay. That's right. Okay. The thing you have to be on guard against is the false prophets. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people out there that call themselves prophets. Isaiah 30.10 says this, who say to the seers, you must not see visions. Remember we talked about this last week? That yes. the people of Israel were saying to the prophets, don't you prophesy. Yeah, don't we don't want to hear it. So that's exactly what they said. And to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. Mm. Isaiah 30, 10. This is, what, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy prophetically that would exist in the last days. When he said in the last days, in those perilous last days, men will not endure sound doctrine, but they'll accumulate for themselves. Teachers will teach according to their own desires. They're going to tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. But you want to know something? Those words will not lead to eternal life. They'll lead someplace else. Because even as far back as, uh, Mark was just asking me about this verse just before we started, in Lamentations 2.14, think of this, and I know we've quoted it before, and it probably won't be the last time I mention it. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. False, false prophets. And there's so many of them around that we're warned. We're not, we're not warned. We are commanded in 1 John chapter 4 to test the spirits for many false prophets. Speaking of the last days in Matthew 24, this is one of the things that Jesus so, so powerfully warned us against. is about the false prophets, false teachers, mm -hmm. false anointed people, right? Be on guard. Be on guard. Okay, what, where, what? Why? Why is God sending these prophets? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Jeremiah 35, 15 says this. Also, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them again and again, saying, turn now every man from his evil way and amend your deeds. Do not go after other gods to worship them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your forefathers, but you have not inclined your ear or listened to me. That's why he sends them. Again, it's the same thing that we saw in, in Lamentations, right? Let's go to the end of the book. Let's go to the end, to Revelation. Mm -hmm. Revelation 19.10. Mm -hmm. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, that's John, right? The Revelator yes. on the island of Patmos. Mm -hmm. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If prophecy, if the prophetic message isn't leading you to a greater understanding of the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, please be warned. The ministry of Jesus was to reconcile men to the Father. Everything else, you ever hear this expression, it's collateral damage? Mm -hmm. Everything else is collateral blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything else is just God's collateral blessing. The purpose of it is, is to restore us to a right relationship with God the Father. 
Paul wrote again in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, and he said, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. It's a comforting word. Yeah. It's to encourage us, to exhort us, mm -hmm. to call us to those higher places. Christ came to lift us up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, to set our feet upon a rock, all right? Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, right? Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked ways, that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he shall die in his sin, and his righteous deeds, which he has done, shall not be remembered. Mm. But his blood I will require at your hand. Mm. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning, and you have delivered yourself. Ezekiel 3, 17 and 21. Mm. Isn't this what Paul said? He said he was guilty of no man's blood because he had preached the whole counsel of God. There are too many people out there preaching, but not the whole counsel. They're picking and choosing the things that attract tickle, people. Tickle their ears. Tickle their ears, right? All right, so that's, that's why. But how do you test? How do you test the prophets? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. First John 4, 1. Right? Here's how you test them. Deuteronomy 18, 21, 22. From the beginning, I mean, God's been telling us. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? How will you know if it's not from God, what this person is speaking? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you shall not be afraid of him. The test of a prophet is, if somebody comes and saying, thus says the Lord, it had better come to pass, because God watches over his word to perform it. If it doesn't come to pass, they've lied. They have presumed on their own, right? And then it goes on in, in, Prover in, well, in Deuteronomy 13, it says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you've not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. And you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you away from the way uh, from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Proverbs 13, 1 to 5. Don't listen to people who just say, Oh, don't touch, God says, don't touch my anointed. You know what? Test, test those who say they're anointed. Test it. Did you say Proverbs 13? It's Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. Yeah. Did I say Proverbs? I think you. No, oh. because I'm here and... Okay. No, I mean, when, when you read no, okay. the last, right. I thought I heard you say Proverbs. But the point is, it's not just a matter of signs and wonders. The devil can do signs and wonders. God sent Moses into that land to deliver his people. Moses did mighty signs. You want to know something? So did Pharaoh's magicians. The, one of the difference was they don't have wisdom. So a lot of things they did, uh, and this, we're kind of running out of time, but I just wanted to share this. One of the plagues that God brought against uh, Egypt was the plague of frogs. Yes, yes. I mean, when, when we talk about a plague of frogs, it just doesn't mean, well, there were a couple of frogs and they were annoying. Mm -hmm. The land was overrun by frogs. Yep, it yep. says the, the frogs, they were, they come out of the river, they were in their houses, they were in their kitchens, they were in their pots, they were in their beds. They were everywhere. everywhere. 
Remember, they wore sandals in those days. Yes. So you got to get the picture. Yes. They're walking around. They're going squish, 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 <laughs> frog juice between the toes. I mean, that's what it was like, right? Yuck. This is incredible. And yet Pharaoh wouldn't listen to, to Moses, wouldn't listen to the Lord. Right. And he calls his magicians. And he says to them, fix this. Yes. <laughs> so you know what they did? Yeah. They, they made, made more, more frogs. frogs. You never make a problem better by making more of it, okay? They had, where they get their power? Listen, Satan is an angel. He may be a fallen angel, but he has that power. He may be able to do things. That's not the test. The test of the matter is, there was a man in the New Testament in the book of Acts named Simon called the magician. And people thought this was the great power of God. It was not. It was magic. It was smoke and mirrors. It was deceit. All right? Mm -hmm. It's not about the signs and wonders. It is about the word that's spoken that is supposed to lead you into a deeper, deeper relationship with the Lord, with the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's not drawing you to God, if that's not the purpose, not drawing you to money, not drawing you to the things of the world that you like, if the, the word of the prophet is not drawing you to a closer relationship to Jesus Christ. Well, okay. We're going to get into the whole rest of this third chapter, I, I promise you. But you have to understand, before I do that, you have to understand that it, re, it really requires a righteous understanding of time. Mm -hmm. Okay? Time is our understanding. How do we know what time is? Time is the, it's all determined by how fast the earth rotates, mm -hmm. how fast the earth goes around the sun, right? It's all based on the world and the things of the world. God's perspective of time can be very, very different. Yes. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night, Psalm 90, verse 4. And Peter wrote and said, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. God's perspective of time is different, but his perspective of time is founded on this one word, eternity. Okay? And eternity is not, as some would have you believe, a long time. Eternity is the absence, absence of time. time. Yes. It just is. Do I understand that? No, and neither do you. But it's true. All right. And God, well, let me tell you what he said. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything appropriate, appropriate in its time. Mm -hmm. He has also set eternity in their hearts. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. God has set eternity in our hearts. We need an eternal perspective as we go to the conclusion of this part of the study next week. Mm -hmm. Not this week. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you have gifted us, that you have gifted us with your word, that you send the prophets to give us those encouraging, constructive, leading words that we might know how to live our lives for you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you have given us eternity in our lives. Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that above all, you have given us the word. We became flesh and dwelt among us and did for us what we could never do for ourselves to remove the stain of sin in our lives. We praise you and bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, time flies by. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my truth.